Today our presentation is called Charismatic Renewal. We started this series off, if you will remember, by looking at the veracity of the Bible and the creation account, comparing it with evolutionary ideas, and then determining whether the Bible can be trusted or not. And then we followed with prophetic views and we looked at the, the view of the reformers regarding the clash between truth and error, between righteousness and unrighteousness, between Christ and Antichrist. And in that lecture, we discussed the little horn power of Daniel chapter 7, who would change times and laws. Subsequently, we looked at the issue of the change of the law, and we saw that Rome had indeed changed the commandments of God. And one of the prominent changes that was made was the change of the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. In other words, from Saturday to Sunday. And Rome claimed that this was a mark of her ecclesiastical power and that she was above the Bible as a consequence. And so we had a look at Revelation chapter 13 where the beasts of Revelation chapter 13 were discussed and we saw that they were a hieroglyph, a combination of the beasts that you found in Daniel chapter 7. And that the reformers had all claimed that the first beast in Revelation chapter 13 was the Roman papacy. And that the second beast would be similar in that it would eventually introduce legislation where the state would control conscience in terms of religious matters. And we looked at the implementation of the mark of the beast and where we stand in the stream of time regarding that issue. And we saw that there was indeed a movement towards Sunday legislation on a worldwide basis which would honor a law which was solely associated with the Roman Church and not with Scripture. And in Revelation chapter 13, we read that the second beast, which we identified with uh, the United States of America in its Protestant form, uh, would have certain criteria. And he doeth great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. Now we discussed this in the last lecture in some detail and we came to the conclusion that this fire was not nuclear power because you don't deceive anyone by that means but that it was a false outpouring of the Holy Spirit by which people would be compelled to believe that the Spirit of God was in a movement that would compel conscience and dictate morality even at the level of the state. Now, how did this come about and how did it happen that we have moved from a time period where the reformers were so clear on the issue of who the Antichrist was to a position where it has become so fuzzy that nobody believes anything that the reformers believed in regard to their doctrine on Antichrist. Well, it is fascinating that the charismatic movement had a great part to play in this. And one of the things that it achieved was to bring together evangelical Christians and Catholicism because the manifestations of the Spirit were similar in both, therefore it had to be the same Spirit. So we have to investigate this issue. And then, not so long ago, Tony, Tony Palmer was the man, 
he's an evangelical that also belongs basically to the Roman Catholic, or belonged to the Roman Catholic charismatic renewal movement, and he felt it his duty to bring this message to the evangelical world that they should reunite with the papacy. Friends and companions, I'm on my way to Rome for two highly important meetings, the Pontifical Office for the Promotion of Christian Unity and Pope Francis. We're discussing the variety and breadth of all the feedback from the publication of Prof. Francis's video, The Miracle of Unity Has Begun. It has been viewed in its various forms more than 800,000 times and we now have a large delegation of non-Roman Catholic church leaders who want to meet Pope Francis and to take the next step towards unity. Please keep us in your prayers. We're living in a historic moment, your brother in Christ. Now, Tony Palmer has since died as a result of an accident, which is a tragedy. But nevertheless, he put something into motion which the Bible actually predicted in advance, that the wound would heal. Now, we saw that the papacy received the political wound when it lost its political power in 1798, when, the, when Napoleon abolished the papal government but that it would get it back, the wound would be healed, and in 1929 it got its power back. But it also had a spiritual wound, which the Protestant world had inflicted and caused a separation. Prior to that, the Eastern religion, the Orthodox, had separated, so the power had been, well, weakened. And now there would be unity again, and the spiritual wound was supposed to heal. Now, when Tony Palmer held his speech, here is Tony Palmer, he uh, attended a convention that was led by Kenneth Copeland, and Kenneth Copeland made comments as to a video by the Pope requesting this unity to commence. And it's interesting that uh, Kenneth Copeland then prayed in tongues for the Pope. Now this history is complicated because the very fact that it is a fulfillment of prophecy and that it is associated with outpourings of the Spirit seem to imply that this is something which might not necessarily be from God but could be from a deceptive spirit. So, how do we reconcile these issues? Pope at charismatic rally in stadium invites them to the Vatican in 2017. Francis also said Catholic charismatics have a special role to play in healing divisions amongst Christians by exercising spiritual ecumenism. Hmm or praying with members of other Christian churches and communities who share a belief in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now it's one thing to preach that we believe in one Lord and Savior, but if the criteria associated with that Lord and Savior are so diverse and so different that some of them cannot be reconciled, then how do you cope with this issue? Protestantism has always taught that the cross was the means whereby atonement for the sins of mankind have been achieved. Whereas Catholicism teaches that atonement is not by the blood of the Lamb, but by the works of Christ, and that Christ need not have died, that salvation could have been by some other means, but the Bible clearly says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Moreover, Catholicism teaches that uh, the sacrifice is a continual sacrifice as enacted in the Mass, and the Bible teaches that by one sacrifice he forever made perfect. The Bible teaches that there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and Catholicism teaches that there are many mediators, 
making Mary, for example, the co-redemptrix and mediatrix for the people of God. So these are thunderous issues which should separate Protestantism from Catholicism. Can two agree? Or can two walk together lest they agree? So how is it possible that a spirit can reunite error with truth and then still be the spirit of God? Is the spirit not the spirit of truth? So in 2017, when they want to get together at the charismatic rally, they want to celebrate this ecumenical spirit that has been achieved through this very movement. And at the same time, they want to prepare for the great 2017 jubilee of the Protestant Reformation, where they want to join together and celebrate it as one for the first time in history. So that would put an end to Protestantism as we know it. Finally, Pope Francis invited the crowd, which included charismatics from 55 countries, to come to St. Peter's Square for Pentecost 2017 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the movement. The Catholic charismatic movement began during a retreat held in 1967 with students and staff from the Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. It's interesting that when this excitement reached the papacy itself, Pope Paul gave an address where he also used ecstatic languages. I expect you all charismatics from around the world to celebrate your great jubilee with the Pope at Pentecost 2017 in St. Peter's Square. So this was the Catholic charismatic movement and the Catholic charismatic movement had exactly the same manifestations as the Pentecostal charismatic movement. And if the, the functions or the outpourings are identical, then the spirit is identical. This is the argument. And if that brings people together, then doctrine must be laid aside because the spirit is the norm and glues everyone together. Question. Can God's spirit speak against the truth of the doctrines of the Bible? Or can he not? Can he be divided against himself? It's interesting that in 2008, in an interview with journal journalist Emil Hakenis, the Jesuit professor, uh, Edward Kimmen, then time General Secretary of the Netherlands Bishop Conference, proclaimed that there remains hardly any reason to remain a Protestant. And he saw Protestantism as an action group that forgot to dissolve itself and a group that had not recognized the significance of a global, visible leadership personality such as the Pope. And we must not forget that the papacy claims infallibility to be free from error when it comes to the proclamation of dogma. Moreover, he stated that he doubted that the Reformation would still exist after 2017, and that is the year when Protestantism commemorates its 500th year of existence. Now this is a long study which is in another series and people can access it. And Protestantism, he said, should return to the Mother Church. Now if they return to the Mother Church and they accept the authority of a human being from the Bible, by criteria has defined as the man of sin, then they are choosing another master. And they will, in effect, have chosen an earthly representative over and above the heavenly representative. Because Rome teaches that salvation is through the system and through its sacramental system, whereas Jesus Christ came all the way down to touch humanity personally so that we have direct access through him to God. Religious news services report that the two sides have decided to bury the hatchet. And they brought out a document from Conflict to Communion, which we have also analyzed in another lecture series. 
which can be accessed and that says that there's little purpose in dredging up centuries-old conflicts. In the document, the two churches recognize that in an age of ecumenism and globalization, the celebration requires a new approach, focusing on reciprocal admission of guilt and on highlighting the progress made by Lutheran-Catholic dialogue in the last 50 years. The fact that the struggle for the truth in the 16th century led to a loss of unity in Western Christendom belongs to the dark pages of church history. And in 2017, we must confess openly that we have been guilty before Christ of damaging the unity of the church. I thought the Protestant Reformation was a new great light in what was called the Dark Ages, and that the Protestant Reformation wasn't darkness in the light of the Dark Ages. So here is somewhat of a confusion. And if they have to acknowledge guilt for the Reformation, that's an acknowledgement that they weren't following the Spirit of Christ. That would negate the entire Protestant Reformation. Now Hebrews 11 verse 1 has this verse. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now verse 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. And I've analyzed this verse many times, but for the sake of completeness, let's look at it again. If you had to have an earthly judge who said to you, you are a witness, therefore come forward and please give the evidence for what you have not seen. Then people will think that the judge has a mental problem. If on the other hand the judge says, will the first witness please step up and testify as to what he or she has seen, and the witness says, Your Honour, this is what I did not see. What would the judge say? Well, the witness has a mental problem. So please get a white coat or something and remove him or her from the stage. Because this definition makes no sense on a human level. Because there is no such thing as evidence for things one has not seen, and there is no substance to something that one hopes for. If I hope to marry someone or other, if that person isn't really there, but is just a figment of my imagination, then there's no substance to it. It's a vague hope, but there's no substance. So the whole definition makes no sense on an earthly level. And yet the Bible says that without faith it is impossible to please God. So how do you get around this issue? Faith is based on what God said in his word. If God said so, it is so. Whether I see it or whether I don't see it. Whether I experience it or whether I don't experience it. King, we will not bow down to your image. And our God is more than able to save you out of your hand. But even if he does not, we will not bow down. What's that? That's faith. That's faith. Based on the word of God. Based on what God had said. There was no evidence at all that they were going to be saved. There was no evidence at all that God would intervene. But by faith, they stood. And this is very important. So scripture is the basis of faith. Abraham hoped for a city whose builder and maker was God. He, he hoped for a city that was somewhere in heaven. Had he ever seen it? No. But he was willing to become a sojourner in a foreign land based on a hope 
that he would never see in his lifetime and he was faithful right up until the end. That's faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Then how can we base faith on all kinds of physical manifestations, which you can see and which you can describe? If you say, I want to see you that I am accepted by God, give me a gift such as speaking in tongue and I get the gift, that's a manifestation that you can witness to, that you can describe. Or better still, I need gold teeth and you get them. That's a manifestation that you can witness to. Then it's no longer evidence of things not seen, but actually perceived and therefore it no longer fulfills the criteria of the definition of faith. So faith in Protestant thinking is word-based, not experiential. Whereas in Catholic thinking, Ignatius Loyola taught that you have to have experiential religion. You have to experience it. And the way to start the process is to imagine yourself into a position or situation until it becomes a reality till you actually have manifestations and can speak and communicate with the spirit world and can have outpourings and ecstasies and everything that goes with it. And then the experience becomes the norm rather than the word. This is very dangerous because you do not know whether the experience comes from God or elsewhere if you do not test the spirit. And what is the criterion for testing the Spirit? The Word of God. There is no other criterion. Martin Luther, as a Protestant source, is always worthwhile quoting. So let's see how Martin Luther thought about the outpouring of the Spirit of God. He who has made himself master of the principles and text of the Word runs little risk of committing errors. A theologian should be thoroughly in possession of the basis and source of faith, that is to say, the Holy Scriptures. Armed with this knowledge, it was that I confounded and silenced all my adversaries, for they seek not to fathom and understand the Scriptures. They run them over negligently and drowsily, they speak, they write, they teach according to the suggestions of their heedless imaginations. My counsel is that we draw water from the true source and fountain, that is that we diligently search the scriptures. That's a very sound piece of advice from Martin Luther. What else have you got to tell us, Martin? Now what the third person is, the holy evangelist St. John teaches in chapter 15 where he says, But when the Comforter is come, which I will send unto you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Jesus speaking. Here Christ speaks not only of the office and work of the Holy Ghost, but also of his substance and faith. He goes out or proceeds from the Father, that is, his going out or his proceeding is without all beginning and everlasting. Therefore the holy prophet Joel gives him the name and calls him the Spirit of the Lord. So it's not a new manifestation according to Martin Luther, but an eternal manifestation. The Holy Spirit has always existed. Not something new, not something unknown, it's well known. He continues, the Son suffers himself to be given to the world and to be lifted up on the cross as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. To this work comes afterwards the third person of the Holy Ghost who kindles faith in the heart through the word and so regenerates us and makes us the children of God. And that is so beautiful. That is so solid. That is so profound. 
Martin Luther continues, we ought not to criticize, explain, or judge the scriptures by our mere reason, but diligently with prayer meditate thereon and seek their meaning. The devil and temptations also afford us occasion to learn and understand the scriptures by experience and practice. Without these, we should never understand them. However diligently we read and listen to them, the Holy Ghost must here be our only master and tutor. And let youth have no shame to learn that preceptor. When I find myself assailed by temptation, I forthwith lay hold of some text of the Bible, which Jesus extends to me, as this, that he died for me, and whence I derive infinite comfort. So where does the Holy Spirit lead you to, according to Martin Luther? To the Scriptures. Go to the Scriptures. This is what it's about. John 14, 15, and 17, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Remember the three definitions of truth in the Bible? Thy word is truth, all thy commandments are truth, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So the Holy Spirit must lead you to the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit must lead you to obedience to the commandments of God, and the Holy Spirit must lead you to Christ. That's the function of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't function of its own accord. It doesn't speak on its own behalf. It always has to lead you to these principles of truth. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Luke 24, verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now this work, word in the Greek means skill. It doesn't mean you become superman. It means you will receive the skill to do what the function is of the Holy Spirit, to proclaim the commandments, the Word, and Jesus. That's what he will do. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. So this is the skill that you will receive in order to proclaim Jesus as the source of all life and salvation. Now here's another Protestant writer. Now the book is The Acts of the Apostles. It is not a conclusive evidence that a man is a Christian because he manifests spiritual ecstasy. You find spiritual ecstasy in Buddhism. You find spiritual ecstasy in shamanism. You find spiritual ecstasy in Hinduism. You find it in all religious manifestations upon this planet. So there's no evidence that you are a Christian because you have spiritual ecstasy under extraordinary circumstances. Holiness is not rapture. It is an entire surrender to the will of God. It is living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. It is trusting God in trial, in darkness as well as in the light. It is walking by faith and not by sight. It is relying on God with unquestionable confidence and resting in His love. I believe that what we've just read is in total harmony with what Scripture teaches. It is not essential for us to be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Spirit is the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth which proceeds from the Father. It is plainly declared regarding the Holy Spirit that in his work of guiding men in all truth, he shall not speak of himself. So there's another criterion of the Holy Spirit which is very important. So when I worship, do I address my worship directly to the Holy Spirit or does the Holy Spirit lead me 
to accept Christ as my personal saviour and as my intercessor and as my advocate. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I believe this is in harmony with Scripture. Here's another one. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture and put a human construction on them, but the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church. Regarding such mysteries which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden. That's a good piece of advice. Or else one can get so hooked up in theologies which link you to, well, dogmas which separate you from the Word, from obedience, and from Christ. What if a spirit comes and says, it doesn't matter whether you keep the law of God, but the spirit, according to the scripture, is supposed to lead you to obedience. Don't we then have a dichotomy of thought? Yes or no? Surely we do. The office of the Holy Spirit is distinctly specified in the words of Christ. Quote, when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. There's nothing here about exalting the individual. There's nothing here about great prosperity. On the contrary, you will feel rather laying in the dust because you will be reproved of your sinfulness you'll be pointed to the source of all righteousness, which is Christ, and you will see that there's a judgment, so you have a choice to make. You're either on this side or on that side of the fence. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. If the sinner responds to the quickening influence of the Spirit, he will be brought to the repentance and aroused to the importance of obeying the divine requirements. I believe that is in harmony with Scripture. Another one, to the repentant sinner, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the Holy Spirit reveals the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He shall receive of mine, says Jesus, and shall show it unto you. Christ said, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, where is it recorded what Christ has said? In the Word, in the Scripture. So again, the Holy Spirit is always associated with Scripture. Christ says, speaking of the Comforter, he shall not speak of himself, he shall testify of me. This is quoting directly from the Scripture. So the Holy Spirit does not act as a separate entity seeking worship. He always directs one to the mediator, which is Christ. So he shall testify of Jesus. He shall not speak of himself. He shall glorify me. This is the function of the Holy Spirit. How little has Christ been preached? The laborers have presented theories, plenty of them, but little of Christ and his love. As the Savior came to glorify the Father by the demonstration of his love, so the Spirit came to glorify Christ by revealing to the world the riches of His love and grace. If the Holy Spirit dwells in us, our work will testify to the fact we shall lift up Jesus. Not one can afford to be silent now. The burden of the work is to present Christ to the world. All who venture to have their own way, who do not join the angels who are sent from heaven with a message to fill the whole earth with its glory, will be passed by. The work will go forward to victory without them and they will have no part in its triumph. Jesus said himself, how many people come to the Father apart from him? Nobody. So if a religious system denies Jesus Christ and says he doesn't exist in their religious system and they worship the Father directly, if they do not know the Son, the Bible says, then they don't know the Father either. Then they are praying, according to Scripture, in a vacuum. If, on the other hand, people acknowledge Christ, but they do not acknowledge 
the law. They claim you don't have to be obedient to the law if the truth is also the law. Well then, we have a crisis on that side as well. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. So this was the gift of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover. And of course it was the commemoration of the giving of the law. So they waited those 50 days, which is a mini jubilee, and there was the outpouring of the Spirit. So Sinai was the giving of the law, and Pentecost was the preaching of the embodiment of the law. Christ, the Messiah, had come to demonstrate the character of the law. So this was why the Spirit was given, to magnify Christ and in Christ the law. Verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now if you count the languages, there were 17 languages. And the Greek there is te idia dialecto, which means in their own mother tongue. Or even better, in that which they were born. So even the nuances of the language were such as if you were born into that language. Now, that's an incredible gift. Have you ever heard uh, a Frenchman speak perfect English with no accent as if he had been born into the English language or a German for that matter? No, you have to have a special privilege of God to be born into that language. So some people are born into more languages than others because they live in an environment where all of them are spoken at once. Then you can do that. But not everybody can do that. So here they were given the special gift to speak in these languages. And verse 8 says, And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born that takes the cultural background of the language and the nuances into account. It's perfect gift. Who confounded the languages in the first place and created them? God. And if you could do that instantly at the Tower of Babel, can it not do it instantly for the purpose of spreading the gospel? And of course this was a local little group with a small number of men that had to proclaim the gospel. What a time to give the gift of tongues so that they could preach to every nation under the sun without having to learn all of these nuances. Today, we don't have that crisis. We don't need the gift of tongues at every turn because we have people who can speak more than one language and can be interpreters and we can draw from them all over the place. So we don't need to have this. It doesn't mean that God cannot do it, or will not do it, under special circumstances. And I know of cases where there was an outpouring of this nature, and I've met people personally who have had this experience, either by hearing something in their own language which wasn't spoken in their own language, or by someone speaking in another language that he was not accustomed or she was not accustomed to. So these things do happen, but in this case, it was to spread the gospel rapidly. Acts 2 verse 11, Cretes, Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Teus hematreus glossia, in our language. So what were they hearing? They weren't hearing gibberish, they were hearing what God had done and wrought. They were hearing the word of God preached. Now, if we want to know what the Spirit is about, then how much better to go and look at the Spirit's outpouring over Christ himself? Because this is the absolute manifestation. 
In Isaiah chapter 56, verse 3 and 5, there is the promise that there would be such an outpouring in other languages. Neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, in other words, come into harmony with God's will and God's law, and take hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than sons and daughters. And then the Bible tells us that they will have manifestations and they will speak. The Holy Spirit convicts also of sin. And when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now we've looked at that already. So this is the function of the Holy Spirit. We must be very clear about this. But Robert Schuller, in his Hour of Power broadcast, said, I don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ that, and under the banner of Christianity, that has proven more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to the evangelism enterprise than the often crude, uncouth, unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. Now, that is the exact opposite of the function of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must convict you of sin, because if I'm not convicted of sin, why would I need a Savior, right? And because I'm convicted of sin, I'm looking for a solution, and it leads me to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ forgives me and puts me back into harmony with his will. That's the plan of salvation. This is totally contrary to the plan of salvation. But these people constructed mega churches in the world. The Holy Spirit also strengthens us against temptation. Even when it came to Jesus, the Bible says, Though you were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey him. Now we know that Jesus was sinless. And that Jesus had no propensity to sin. He was the sinless, spotless Son of God. But he was subject to the same troubles and turmoils and temptations that we have, and he laid hold of the power of God in the form of the Holy Spirit to resist sin, and the devil had to flee from him. So this is what it says. So we have access to this Holy Spirit because Christ has promised that this would be the case. So known sin actually silences the Spirit of God. Psalms 51 verse 22, poor David, who was in a spot after all that he had manufactured in terms of sin, says, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So why is it that people believe that the Holy Spirit was only poured out at Pentecost and didn't exist before. Well, you just have to go to Genesis and you'll see that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. So he was there from the beginning. The only difference here and Pentecost is that the Messiah had not yet been born. And here in, at Pentecost, the disciples were empowered to preach Jesus as the Messiah. So here the Holy Spirit could direct them to Jesus, whereas in the Old Testament, he was only directing them in type to the Lamb that was to be slain on behalf of their sins. But it didn't preach Jesus until he came. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. So he will teach you all things. And because he will bring into remembrance what Jesus had said, he must lead you to the Word. The Holy Spirit will make the Word palatable so that you can internalize it and it can change you. And the Holy Spirit leads us to truth. And we are these witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that 
obey him. You cannot separate the Holy Spirit from obedience. You must also, in terms of one's personal life, separate the workings of the Spirit from the gifts of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit strives with whom to bring them to Christ? With all of humanity. The Holy Spirit is that still quiet voice which speaks in your heart and tells you that you have need of a Savior. This little voice that constantly reminds you of where you are transgressing God's law and gives you a conscience when you do something bad, even if you don't know Jesus Christ, that is the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it will prod you, prod you in a direction. It will prick you, as the Bible says. And Paul had a conscience. And when he looked into the eyes of Stephen and he saw that face, his conscience was pricking him, but he kicked against the pricks until he was convicted, and that changed him. So the Holy Spirit will always lead you to obedience. And when you have accepted Jesus as the Messiah, and you have accepted that you have to come back into harmony with his will and obey him, then when you are baptized, God pours out his spirit so that he imparts gifts to you whereby you can effectively preach the gospel. It doesn't have to be a perf particular manifestation. It can be a simple thing like the gift of hospitality, of making people feel comfortable. It doesn't have to be a gift like being a, a speaker or an evangelist or whatever. And no one gift is better or higher than another. So the Holy Spirit would bring individuals to repentance of sin, guiding them in a fuller understanding of the truth about God's word and Jesus Christ. That's biblical. We've looked at the texts. Secondly, it is the fulfillment that is to benefit those who are brought into the church by the gospel witness. John 17, 20, Acts 2, 38. So you become empowered by the Spirit to preach Christ. What's the first thing when you are converted that you feel when you realize, I was lost and now I have this tremendous gift of salvation? What's the first thing that comes to mind? What about my... What about my, isn't it? Mother. What about my father? What about my sister? What about my brother? What about my children? What about my grandchildren? Who puts those thoughts into your mind? You never had them before. Who put them there? The Holy Spirit puts them there. And then what does the Holy Spirit impel you to do when you have those thoughts? You go and witness. That's the gift. Not some special manifestation where you sit down in luxury and enjoy it. It's always for the purpose of spreading the gospel. So the gift of tongues was to communicate the gospel to different language groups. And there's a definition in the Bible. And if the definition has been given, that is what applies. Acts 19, we see that tongues and prophecy are associated and thus serve to communicate the gospel. This is why tongues was given. Isaiah chapter 11. This is the verse where we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Christ, and we can see how it manifests itself. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Isn't that incredible? So is everything there logical? Does it ever bypass your cognitive functions? doesn't appear to me that it does because it's the spirit of wisdom. Wisdom comes from God. Understanding means 
your cognitive function, spirit of counsel and might, surely you must use your mind for that, the spirit of knowledge, you use your mind for that, and the fear of the Lord is understanding the scriptures and worshipping God. So if we read in 1 Corinthians 14, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with my understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with my understanding also. In other words, God never bypasses your decision-making capacity. He doesn't give you a feeling or a manifestation which bypasses the cognitive functions. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which is the chapter that is used by the movements of the day, the Pentecostal movements, to validate the fact that there is a nonsensical speaking in tongues, it totally ignores the fact that, that's, that that chapter is written as an antithetical parallelism, where Paul contrasts what is right with what is wrong. And he will quote dictums, the Spirit utters, but it is unfruitful, etc. Then he'll contrast it with a but, but. Or he'll use a dictum, food for the stomach, stomach for the food, but God will destroy both this and these in the judgment. You see, dictums, like for example, the Epicurean dictum that stomach is for the, the stomach is for food and food is for the stomach, was the dictum that it doesn't matter what you do with your body, because your body is just a vessel in Greek thinking. It's just a vessel. So whether I use it to eat whatever I want to, or whether I use it to gratify my senses, whether fornicating or otherwise, doesn't matter, it's just a tent, you're going to throw it off, the spirit is what counts. So Paul quotes the dictum, and you could easily take the dictum and say, oh, Paul is saying it doesn't matter, but then he says, but God will destroy both this and this. So he doesn't agree with the dictum. And as you go through it, you'll see that he constantly contrasts right with wrong, right with wrong. If I speak in an unknown tongue, but I do not understand it, who will profit? Who will understand what I'm saying if there's not someone who will interpret it? So if the original language was a real language, then there must be a real interpreter. There's no point if I speak to you in German today and there's no interpreter to interpret it for you. I'm wasting my time and I'm wasting your time. So, when Paul says, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, and my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful, what is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. I will never separate the cognitive from the other. God doesn't work that way. So this is a fascinating thing when we come to the modern Pentecostal movement. Now let's go and see if we can link what is happening in the world, the demise of Protestantism, the giving up of the essential doctrines of the Bible for the sake of unity based on manifestations. Is that biblical? He will deceive by means of the fire. And the mortal wound of the first beast will be healed as a consequence. And then an image will be set up. And this image will dictate morality. The Second Vatican Council and the Charismatic Renewal. On the 25th of January 1959, only two months after his election as Pope, John XXIII surprised the world by announcing the Council to give the Church the possibility to contribute more effectively to the solution of the problems of the modern age. So here the church opened its doors to receive the separated brethren. Not by changing its doctrine in any form or shape, 
but by pretending to be open. Vatican II also initiated the charismatic movement, and Cardinal Suens was the one who was put in charge of that. By the way, he's also a Templeton Prize recipient in 1976, which makes him part of the secret societies of the world. So he was a Mason, being in initiated on June 15, 1967. He was chosen by Pope John XXIII to be one of the chief architects of the Vatican II meetings, and he served on all four of its major committees. And he stated, Since I've had this charismatic experience, my allegiance to the Holy Father as the Vicar of Christ in the world has been heightened and strengthened. My appreciation for Mary as the co-redemptress and mediatoress of my salvation has been assured. My appreciation of the Mass as the sacrifice of Christ has now been heightened. Question. Are any of those points that he just mentioned even vaguely biblical, yes or no? No. Now, if the Holy Spirit is to lead you into all truth, and the Word is truth, then this Spirit that is manifested over here is totally contrary to the Word of God. So it cannot be the Holy Spirit. It cannot be. Because the Holy Spirit cannot be divided against itself. Vatican II said this about the Chorisms. It is not only through the sacraments and church ministries that the Holy Spirit sanctifies. And by the way, is that biblical? No. Nothing you can do. Martin Luther said you can do sacrifices and take the sacraments as often as you like. It means nothing if the heart has not been changed. Church ministers, the Holy Spirit, sanctifies and leads people to God. He distributes special graces amongst the faithful of every rank. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for profit. And then he quotes 1 Corinthians, These charismatic gifts, whether they be the most outstanding or the more simple and widely diffused, are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation, for they are exceedingly suitable and useful for the needs of the church. Interesting. Interesting. Must I receive them without question, or must I test the spirits? The Bible says I must test the spirits. Pope Paul VI said, speaking at the International Conference on the Catholic Charismatic Renewal in 1975, when he also spoke in tongues, by the way, encouraged the attendees uh, in their renewal efforts and especially to remain anchored in the church. 1975 marks the year of the renewal's coming of age in the Catholic Church. Pope Paul VI told the group of 10,000 charismatics. He said, quote, Nothing is more necessary to this more and more secularized world than the witness of the spiritual renewal that we see the Holy Spirit evoking in the most diverse regions and milieu. How then could this spiritual renewal not be the chance for the church and for the world? And how in this case could one not take all the means to ensure that it remains so? So this was to lead the separated brethren back into the arms of Rome. Bishops, archbishops, cadent cardinals struggling to keep their hats in place, sang and danced in ecstasy, embracing one another, raising their arms to heaven, and Pope Paul VI address was punctuated with ecstatics. Christianity Today, 1975. A tongue-speaking Pope and a manifestation with doctrines that are totally contrary to the Word of God. So this manifestation cannot, by definition, be from God. It's interesting, concerning the Jesuits, Alberto wrote, Catherine Kuhlman was one of Rome's greatest undercover agents assigned to penetrate the Pentecostals and Protestants through the charismatic movement. She was a master of hypnosis and had tremendous psychic powers. As a reward for her outstanding work, she was granted a private audience with the Pope. As a result of her work, most now teach unity, but seldom preach separation and holiness, which Rome dreaded. 
So is it possible that Rome initiated these movements with undercover agents? Here is Catherine Kuhlman in one of her healing crusades. And uh, she is here, 20th century American faith healer. She believed in miracles and deliverance by the power of the Holy Spirit and was part of the Pentecostal arm of the Protestant Christianity. And it's interesting that Tony Palmer went to the evangelical world, which also speaks in tongues, like um, the Pentecostal leaders that he was associated with, and said, we must all rejoin with Rome now. In 1972, she was known for her healing crusades. In fact, Time magazine once called her a veritable one-woman shrine of Lourdes. And she was granted an honorary doctor, doctorate by Oral Roberts University. And what's also interesting that in 1973, Benny Hinn attended one of her healing crusades, and this was the catalyst for his ministry. So here is an interesting connection. Now Homer Duncan in the ecumenical movement gives this description of what happened in 1975 at the Full Gospel Convention where she was present. At the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship World Convention held in Anaheim, California in 1975, various speakers from different denominations used such expressions as charismatic ecumenism. And you see how the charismatic movement is being used to glue Protestantism back to Catholicism. And it was called the Lord's ecumenism and the charismatic Eucharist. Now, excuse me, how can Protestants speak of a charismatic Eucharist? The emphasis on reconciliation with all churches was a major theme, and charismatic Catholics were prominent on the program. Catherine Kuhlman said, I want you to know that Pope Paul VI would have fit in very well with this great worldwide convention. He would have understood everything that was happening, and we would have understood this is a part of God's great plan. Which God are we talking about? At the same convention, the Roman Catholic priest John Bertolucci, a main evening speaker, told of his Holy Spirit baptism. He said, during the week we have had charismatic mass. Just a gorgeous experience of worshipping the Lord in the midst of the Holy Eucharist. The Holy Eucharist, remember, is a continual sacrifice. It's not biblical. He continued, but you know the Lord is doing the whole thing. He's pouring out His Spirit on all flesh, on all denominations, on anybody, and this is the Lord's ecumenism. The Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland's Clerk of the Synod, Reverend Donald MacLean's comment in his letter to the Times magazine, tells us what this man thought of the ecumenical movement. And uh, it is such a, uh, let me call it a breath of fresh air, to hear a Protestant still speak like this. He wrote, The ecumenical movement which you praise is the greatest disaster to affect the Christian church this century. It has reduced the professing churches of this country to a collection of bloodless, spineless, and boneless organizations, which can hardly raise a whimper on the side of Christ and His truth. Small wonder that evil progresses as it does, and spiritual darkness becomes more intense as the years go by. You appear to regard a body of professing Christians, because they criticized the reformers, the early reformers, of sober conduct and deep spirituality of mind as fanatical and bigoted? If this be so, then the eminent men of God, such as John Knox in Scotland, John Calvin and Martin Luther on the continent, and Archbishop Cranmer in England, were bigots in their contest with the errors of popery. We are glad to be in such company. Amen. So there are still people who are attached to the Word of God and understand what it means to be at variance with Scripture. But 
the system rolled on. Pope John Paul II and the charismatic renewal. Well, he himself was the most charismatic pope that ever had lived, probably. And while he met some 500,000, half a million representatives of various movements in the Catholic Church, on the eve of Pentecost he proclaimed, Open yourselves docilely to the gifts of the Spirit. Accept gratefully and obediently the charisms which the Spirit never ceases to bestow on us. Again, this is not biblical. I cannot accept any spirit. I must know it's the spirit from God. If I attend a voodoo conference and I feel a spirit wanting to manifest itself in me, I better put on my turbo and get out of there. So if it doesn't bring me to the Word, if it doesn't bring me to obedience to Christ and His precepts, if it doesn't bring me to the only means of salvation, well then I have a problem with the Spirit. And yet, this is the convention. And these are the Catholic charismatics. Now just think of the, of the power that they have in the world and uh, how many of them are not undercover agents even in the Protestant world. So charismatic priests, many different movements met in the Vatican. And then the Catholic charismatic movement had some very fascinating things to hear, to listen to. This is the Pontifical Council for the Laity. We have experienced the grace of a new Pentecost. There are many signs of hope which have flourished for the mission of the Church, amongst which are the discovery and the appraisals of the charisms, the renewed zeal for evangelism and the advancement of lay people. Evangelism in what sense? To spread Christ or to unify the churches? And John Paul made the following statement. He said, come Holy Spirit, come and renew the face of the earth. Come with your seven gifts. Come Spirit of life, Spirit of communion and love. The church and the world need you. Come Holy Spirit. Just a brief question here. Who is he addressing directly? He's addressing the Holy Spirit directly. He's talking to the Holy Spirit. I thought nobody comes to the Father except by, by Christ. And make ever more fruitful the charisms you have bestowed on us. Give new strength and missionary zeal to these sons and daughters of yours. Pope John has stated boldly that the movements are the hope of the church. And Cardinal Ratzinger said exactly the same thing. With the Second Vatican Council, the Comforter, recently gave the church, this is Pope John Paul II, which according to the fathers is the place where the Spirit flourishes, this is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, a renewed Pentecost instilling a new unforeseen dynamism. Whenever the Spirit intervenes, he leaves people astonished. He brings about events of amazing newness. He radically changes persons and history. This was the unforgettable experience of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, during which, under the guidance of the same Spirit, the Church rediscovered the charismatic dimension as one of her consti constitutive elements. It is not only through the sacraments, and then he repeats that statement, but also through the manifestation of the Spirit that the Church can flourish. And Benedict, after him, I've had the joy and the grace to see young Christians touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. At the same time of exhaustion, when there was talk of a winter in the church, the Holy Spirit was creating a new spring. Fascinating. The church was languishing under a wound because Protestantism had separated. And now under the Spirit, the wound was healing before the eyes of humanity. Rome, May the 7th, 2006, Zenit, official magazine. More than 10,000 members of communities of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal will observe the vigil of Pentecost with Benedict. And they, they noted that it was the unknown God. The Holy Spirit, considered until a few years ago as the unknown God, is the one who with his grace tirelessly 
changes the lives of thousands of people in all corners of the world, and who with renewed joy through the experience of baptism in the Spirit, begin a new life lived precisely in the Holy Spirit. Question, is this in harmony with the Word of God? No. We've read what Martin Luther said about the Holy Spirit. We've read what other Protestants have said about the Holy Spirit. Where do we read that the Holy Spirit is an unknown God? He will proceed from the, from the Father. He will testify of Jesus Christ. He will lead you, and then the Bible gives all his criteria. There's nothing unknown about the Holy Spirit. But he will not testify of himself and he will not manifest of himself, always through Scripture and through Christ. Now this is an astonishing statement. He is the one we wish to honor and glorify publicly. Responding to the appeal that both John Paul II as well as Benedict made to the Catholic Charismatic movement and the whole church, to spread the culture of Pentecost and the action of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church and in each of the faithful, the director added. This celebration, which will include moments of prayer, listening, witness, invocation of the Spirit, will end with a celebration of prayer, music, concert and dance, which will be presented as prayer by artists of different countries, and all to give glory to the Holy Spirit. I thought the Holy Spirit would glorify Christ. Is there something wrong with this theology? This is not biblical. So the manifestations that bring about this unity cannot be biblical either. This is a serious crisis. Can this be fire from heaven? that deceives people and leads them back into harmony with the first beast and brings them to pay homage to the first beast whose mortal wound had been healed? Is this a possibility? The Cantamalesa of the pontifical household preacher and Father Tom Forrest, one of the initiators of the charismatic experience, will speak on the grace and power of the Holy Spirit during the celebration. So all the honor and the glory go to an unknown God and his manifestations when the Holy Spirit is the quiet witness to the veracity of the word and salvation in Christ. Can you see that Jesus is being marginalized here? He's set aside. This is another door through which you enter, but this is not the door that Christ gave. So Vatican II, far from bringing a breath of fresh air, was a deceptive breath. Now when it comes to the music, Vatican II was quite specific as to how it should be. These are the documents from Vatican II, and it says, in the section on music, in order that the faithful may actively participate more willingly and with greater benefit, it is fitting that the format of the celebration and the degree of participation in it should be varied as much as possible, according to the solemnity of the day and the nature of the congregation. So the nature of the congregation determines what kind of music you play. So if you have a young swingy group, you play young swingy music. If you have a heavy metal crowd, you play heavy metal. And then the liturgy marvelously increases the church's power to preach Christ, a sign under which the scattered children of God may be gathered together until there is one fold and one shepherd. I wonder who that shepherd will be. According to Vatican II, certainly not Jesus Christ. Vatican II set great emphasis on sung or musical celebration. They were considered to be the most effective style of celebration service. So you had to use recent heritage of sacred music, popular religious songs, playing of the organ, or other instruments, depending on who was there. And there must be physical movement. 
So there must be external movement, external participation, gestures, bodily attitudes, acclamations, responses and singing. So you had to become a mobile congregation. Your arms had to be moving. Who can read the word of God if your arms are constantly moving? The Spirit will not lead you to an appreciation of the word. And these were the pictures of the theologians as they participated more and more in these activities. And I'm wondering if the preacher involved here is interested in the manifestation of the spirit or in the manifestation of the stomach. Is this what the Holy Spirit will lead to? And the first thing that is sacrificed when the spirit is poured out, heiße Eisen, alte Zöpfe, der Kreis, der the Papst soll nicht mehr Antichrist genannt werden. We have to bury the hatchet. Bury the hatchet. The Pope is no longer the Antichrist. Is Daniel in error? Is Paul in error? Is John the Revelator in error? This is an amazing turnaround. Right from the beginning in the Protestant movement, the Protestants were associated with the papacy. The father of Protestant Pentecostalism is a man called Mr. Pentecost, David Duplessis. Now, David Duplessis hails from my own country. You have no idea what a prominent role the South Africans have actually played in the worldwide charismatic movement. Mr. Pentecost is the one who is, well, associated with the very beginning of the manifestation amongst Protestants. People like Rodney Howard Brown hail from South Africa. And here you see Mr. Pentecost with Pope Paul VI. And uh, it's fascinating that the papacy was involved in this movement right from the very beginning. And if we look at what was claimed about Catholic Kuhlman, the suspicion arises that many of the so-called Pentecostal leaders from the Protestant world might actually have an involvement which is not readily divulged in the press. Let me put it that way. Now, hailing from South Africa, where the charismatic movement is very prominent, is this amazing book, Die Belofte van Sy Wederkomst, which means the promise of his return. And it lists the professors of the great Pentecostal movements in Southern Africa. So these are the top preachers and theologians who also teach at the prominent universities. And I'm always fascinated as to what they say. And if I can read to them to you what they say. This is an extract from this book, and I've translated it into English. It says, the old covenant was annulled with the portrayal of Judas. Uh, where do we read that in the Bible? Those who still try to keep the law are not spiritually of age and have not yet received the Holy Spirit. If the law is still read these days, because the Dutch Reformed Church used to read the law every Sunday. But they've ceased doing that because the Pentecostals have ceased doing that. So if the law is still read these days, it must be for people that are not of age, that is for unbelievers. This is the only sense in which the law is still applicable today. Believers live through the Spirit and are not under the law. So they're not literally saying that you shouldn't keep the law, but they continue. Believers that try to keep the law are in slavery, but believers that live in the fullness of the new covenant are free. Therefore, it is dangerous for believers in the church period to be associated with the law. That's rather incredible, don't you think? Churches that read the Ten Commandments on Sunday in the assembly bring their members under the impression that they are still under the law and that they must try to keep the law. Christians who today try to keep the Ten Commandments hinder the work of the Holy Spirit and undermine the pure essence of the New Covenant. That's quite an incredible statement. But my Bible says, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, here's the patience of the saints. 
Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So it seems to me that the theology is not in harmony with Scripture. What about Rick Warren? Here he is, seen shaking the hand of Pope Benedict because he, uh, Pope Francis, because he recently visited him. And he stated God loves all kinds of music because he invented it all, fast, slow, loud, soft, old, new. There's no biblical style. There's no such thing as Christian music. There are only Christian lyrics. It is the words that make a song sacred, not the tune. There are no spiritual tunes. Has he never heard of rhythm and the effect of rhythm? Has he never heard of these things? This is quite incredible. The style of music you choose in your service will be one of the most critical decisions you make in the life of your church. I'm sure Jesus did that when he appeared before the people, when he preached the great sermons of the Beatitudes, for example. Did he say, well, what kind of a crowd do I have? Do I need the bongo drums? Do I need electric guitars? What can I conjure up in order to keep this crowd happy? Do you read anything like that in the scripture? I don't. I don't. In fact, if you go to the times of war, where people used to gather quietly in cellars not to be noticed, it was the quiet reading of the word that sustained them. Music can play an essential part. It can lift you up into the presence of God. Music properly conducted is a prayer. But music has to have certain criteria. And those are, they must make sense, the lyrics. They must be melodious. They must be harmonious. And they must be worshipful. That's it. Those are the criteria. There are no other criteria. You must match your music to the kind of people God wants your church to reach. Is that so? Did Jesus do that? I don't recall him ever having done that. Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. But can you notice that wisdom must not be separated and the word must not be separated from the songs? You cannot have a bedlam of noise and call that the outpouring of the Spirit. He says we use drums, clashing cymbals, loud trumpets, etc. We're the flock that likes to rock. We use the style of music the majority of people in the church listen to on the radio. We were talking about this barrier breaking down between black, white, Pentecostal, different groups growing up as a Protestant boy. I knew nothing about Catholics, so he claims. And I started watching ETWN, the Catholic channel, and I said, well, I'm not as far apart from these guys as I thought I was, you know. No wonder the news tells us that he went to Pope Francis and he called on non-Catholic Christians to join Pope Francis and the Catholic Church in pursuit of their common goals. Isn't this a fascinating thing that all these churches that practice and have these manifestations are all returning to Rome. Pope Francis's deep ties to evangelicals. This is the Roman Catholic National Reporter. That's their official documentation where they tell you when the World Meeting of Families announced its roster of speakers for its September meeting in Philadelphia, some were surprised to see Rick Warren's name amongst the invitees. And what is the issue when it comes to this day of the families? If we looked at the European issue, then it is to bring the families together and to make a day of rest, the Sunday, part and parcel of this venture. And music will play a prominent role in this. Because when I read in the book of Daniel, which is the type of what will happen to the, at the end, I read there that when the statue that Nebuchadnezzar erected, the image that he erected, 
when everybody had to bow down to the image, then it was done with all kinds of music. And the instruments are listed, and over and over Daniel repeats. And when you hear the sound of the set of the lyre, let everyone bow down. And the king said, when you hear the sound of the set of the lyre, let everyone bow down. Do you think music is going to play a prominent role at the end of time when it comes to worshipping the image of the beast? Absolutely. So he's going to speak at this United, in the United States and the World Meeting of Families, which is sponsored by the Holy See's Pontifical Council for the Family, and it's the largest Catholic gathering of families. Warren will join Cardinal St. Malley in offering a shared keynote address titled The Joy of the Gospel of Life. Interesting. But he also claims that the first Reformation was be about belief and this one's about behavior, said Warren. What kind of behavior? And he also said that the first one was about creeds, this one is about deeds. The first one divided the church, this time it will unify the church. It can only unify the church if you set aside the scriptures, if you set aside dogma, and you have the leading of a spirit, which the Bible says can be a false and deceptive spirit with all kinds of miracles, signs and wonders. Joel Austin meets Pope Francis with a prominent Mormon. So it seems it doesn't matter what kind of religion comes together. Joel Austin with his prosperity gospel, that's all you hear. You would, you would imagine if you join his church, tomorrow you'll be a multimillionaire. It's incredible. And the, and the Mormons, Brigham Young said, the devil told the truth about Godhead. I would not have Mother Eve miss eating the forbidden fruit for anything. Through the gift of sin, man can achieve Godhood. Does that belong together? This is incredible. And uh, not only Brigham Young, but Joseph Smith, he also in his book claimed similar sentiments. Through the gift of sin, said Brigham Young, we can achieve godhood. Joseph Smith said, man can have joy. So is joy associated with sin? This is rather confusing. And then they apply the order of Melchizedek to their priesthood, which I thought was exclusive to Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter what the dogma of a religious body is, whether it is preaching that the Spirit will manifest itself in the outpouring of gold and silver in mint, or whether it means that the devil spoke the truth in the Garden of Eden. It seems everybody is brought together by the Spirit. Toronto blessing to soften Christians to accept the new age. Now, this is interesting. Benjamin Cream, the person who is representing the Maitreya, or the New Age Christ, was recently asked about the Toronto Blessing. His response was that he thought the Toronto Blessing was a good thing. It is, according to him, the method being used by his spiritual masters to soften up Christian fundamentalists to accept the New Age Christ when he appears. I have no reason to doubt that statement because I can see that it's gone into fruition. So this manifestation by a false Christ, if he claims this, then is this spirit the spirit of God? Or is it another spirit? Doesn't the Bible say in Revelation chapter 18, Babylon is fallen, has fallen, she has become the house of demons, and every unclean and detestable bird. What is the bird the symbol of? The Spirit of God. So here's an unclean bird. So that's a false spirit. So this is rather serious issue. So let's just make sure that we are not getting our lines crossed here. This is the recent visit of Kenneth Copeland to the Vatican, where he prayed for the Pope. And previously to that, he prayed for the Pope in tongues. 
Now, in his sermons, he said, you don't have a God in you, you are one. Isn't that the similar sentiment to what Brigham Young had said? Now, Peter said, by exceeding great and precious promises, you become partakers of the divine class. All right, are we gods? We are a class of gods. The Adam, that Adam was manifest in the flesh. God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean, a reproduction of himself in the Garden of Eden, he did just that. He was not a little like God, he was not almost like God, he was not subordinate to God even, excuse me. Adam is as much as like God as you could get, just the same as Jesus. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifest in the flesh. Is that biblical? Or is that the voice of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, ye shall be as gods? This one was very fascinating, one of his sermons. The Spirit of God spoke to me and said, Son, realize this, now follow me in this, and don't let your tradition trip you up. He said, think this way, don't let your tradition trip you up. A twice-born man whipped Satan in his own domain. Now, right there, there's a serious problem. Was Jesus born again? Did he have to be born again? No, he was the sinless, spotless Son of God. He did not have to be born again. And I threw my Bible down. You will have to throw it down because it doesn't make any sense anymore. Like that. I said, what? He said, a born-again man defeated Satan. This is God speaking to him. The firstborn of many brethren defeated him. He said, you are the very image, the very copy of that one. And I said, goodness gracious, sakes alive. And I began to see what had gone on there. And I said, well, no, you don't mean, you couldn't dare mean that I could have done the same thing. He said, this is God speaking, oh yeah. If you'd had the knowledge of the word of God that he did, you could have done the same thing because you're a reborn man too. So this is man bringing about his own salvation. Then you don't need the blood of Christ. This is a denial of the atonement. Can you believe that the Holy Spirit will manifest itself and associate itself with such a doctrine? Yes or no? Can I be? So when he speaks in tongues, is it the manifestation of the Spirit of God or is it the manifestation of another spirit? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, they have no light in them. And you have to judge them by their fruits. Besides all the Masonic paraphernalia, he also uses the word I am. And I say this with all respect, so I don't upset you too, too bad, but I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. Now, i let you in on a little hint. This is Jesuit doctrine. This is Jesuit doctrine. And we will trace it in a, in a future lecture. We'll see where it comes from. Because this doctrine is the serpentile doctrine of the Garden of Eden. And we have to see in this world who the harborers of that doctrine is today. And we'll leave that for a future lecture. Well, Benny Hinn, who attended Catherine Kuhlman's crusade, says, don't tell me you have Jesus. You are everything he was and everything he is and ever shall be. Don't say I have. Say I am, I am, I am. That's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. And this is no longer Christianity. This is another religion. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. But he answered and said, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That is true Christianity. That is Protestantism. Revelation 14, verse 12, he has the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So if these manifestations do not rest in the word of God, and if they deny obedience to the commandments of God, they cannot possibly be from God. 
And the only solution to this is when God says, separate yourself. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sin. That's what the Bible says. And I don't say these things lightly because there are many, many sincere people trapped in this form of religion. I've spoken to so many and many of them have told me, I know there's something wrong, but I can't put my finger on it. And I'm scared if it's not the manifestation of God, what it will do to me. But I'm scared if I may separate myself, whether I will separate myself from the manifestation of God. So this is not meant in a judgmental sense. This is a biblical expose of what the Spirit is all about. And this is an appeal to the Pentecostal world out there and to the members of the Pentecostals to reconsider the biblical basis of their structure and where they are heading. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are living in very troubled times. Fire will be poured from heaven and men will be deceived to honor the first beast. And we see this manifestation as the Protestant world rushes to reunite with Rome, irrespective of the dogmas and traditions that are held. Lord, if the Spirit is to be in harmony with the Word, then the movement cannot be. And so I pray that you will open the eyes of the people that are trapped in these systems, and that you will open the eyes of your own children that they may preach the word with power and bring the last warning of last message of warning to a dying world. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.